everyone, and welcome to our DAT IQ weekly market update. This is our update for May 11th, 2021. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics at DAT, joined as always by Dean Croak, who's our Principal Industry Analyst, and Ned Damon, who is our Principal Data Scientist. Welcome, guys. Hey, howdy. Hey, good to be with you. So before I get started, I need to know, get your bingo card out, who had a major ransomware piracy attack on one of the nation's largest fuel pipelines on their freight disruption bingo card. Anyone? No. 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 Wow. We need to get more printed, I guess, and maybe make them like the big ones and get some more daubers. And I don't know. As we work Ooh. through the year, I'm, I'm afraid we're probably going to be hearing more and more of these kind of things, right? Right. 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 Uh, so for those not familiar, uh, we're here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, 7 a.m. Pacific, talking about trends in the freight market, uh, what we're seeing, and most importantly, answering your questions. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the comment or chat. We have a team of marketing folks who get those over to us, and it helps if you get them in early because it gives us more time to sort through them and get you an answer. They typically all come in at the end. So um, the more that you can do to help us with that, the better. Before I dive into our key points of the week, we have a lot going on this week. It's TIA's Capital Ideas conference, I believe is the exact title, but um, three-day show. DAT is going to have several presentations, so I'll be joined by Dr. Chris Kaplis and Kevin Zwire talking about RFPs. We have Steve Blair um, from Keypoint uh, talking about growing your brokerage. We have Mark Bryant, who heads up our technology, um, talking about security and things like that, plus a ton of other great speakers um, not linked to DAT. Highly recommend you checking that out um, this week. And with that, I'm going to move us into our key trends for the week, because there are quite a few of them. So if you remember, last week was Road Check Week. I don't want to spoil any of the goodies, but lots to talk about there. Kind of remarkable um, what happened last week. Um, Really, the key things that Dean's going to cover are going to be the impact on load-to-truck ratio as well as rates, um, and just kind of like the underlying volumes. Because this is a week where the the load-to-truck ratio itself needs to be broken down into its core components to really understand what's going on. Um, And then I mentioned the pipeline kind of in jest, but in all seriousness, there's already an hours of service exemption in place. Um, That pipeline carries roughly 45 to 50% of all the fuel heading east. Uh, We're already seeing reports of regionalized or localized uh, shortages of uh, gasoline. So something to watch. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean, and he's going to walk us through our market update. Dean? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, yeah, lots happening last week. Um, on the spot market, though, there was almost no change in spot market volumes in the uh, dry van sector. Uh, but carriers took a lot of time off uh, collectively. So equipment posts were down 12% week over week. So for contest, uh, context, normally we see about a 5% drop in equipment posts as carriers take time off. Uh, more than double that last week. As a result, the dry van load to truck ratio took off and uh, increased about 60% jumped to 7.84. In the uh, refrigerated load-to-truck ratio sector, load posts surged again last week, a lot of Mother's Day volume and, of course, produce season. But carriers tend to take off much more time in that road check week uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, Load post volumes did increase substantially last week, which is is not... uh, unsurprising in that particular time frame with Mother's Day sort of surging with flowers towards the end of the week. But combined with a 20% drop in equipment posts versus a 12% five-year average, the load-to-truck ratio almost doubled last week to 19.37. In the flatbed sector, flatbed load post volumes dropped slightly, not a big change, um, but the load-to-truck ratio remains at its highest level that we've seen since 2016. Uh, flatbed carriers, there was about 5% fewer equipment posts last week, uh, but that was enough to push the load-to-truck ratio up another 14% to about 117 loads per truck, and that surpasses the highest level that we saw in 2018 when capacity was pretty tight. So moving over to the market condition index and having a look at the dry van sector, lots to cover today. Uh, Atlanta is still the number one spot market for load post volumes. It had a 19% week-over-week increase. But no change in capacity rates stayed around 240. Uh, Houston volumes jumped 28% last week. Uh, Rates moved up only a cent per mile to an average of 215. Same sort of uh, result in Dallas on the West Coast. Capacity tightened slightly. Not a big change in rates in Ontario and Los Angeles. They both, both moved up about one cent per mile to 302 per mile out of Ontario and 292 a mile out of Los Angeles. 
Uh, capacity was tight, though, for a lot of loads inbound to Chicago last week. Inbound load posts were up 9% week over week. Capacity was tight on a lot of lanes. There was a lot of upward movement in rates. Memphis to Chicago is a, a typically a strong volume lane for intermodal competition also. It's a big distribution hub. Rates were up last week to 303 per mile. That's a $0.44 cents a mile increase. Um, compared to this time in April and about a buck 48 mile higher than this time last year. Having a look at the refrigerated market condition index, uh, even though the outbound load post volumes dropped in Miami and Lakeland, capacity was extremely tight last week during road check week. Um, rates were up 27 cents a mile out of Miami to 273, that's excluding fuel. And they, out of Lakeland, they were up 14 cents a mile to 235. Uh, refrigerated volumes out of Los Angeles, uh, Strawberry season's hitting its peak in the Oxnard and uh, Santa Maria and Salinas areas, so we're seeing a lot of volume out of those three areas. It's peak shipping week, for those that don't know, in the strawberry uh, industry, about 90% of our strawberries come out of those three freight markets on the, on the coast of California. They're currently running about 10 million trays per week, and if you do the math on that, that's about 2,200 truckloads of strawberries uh, heading all over the country. Um, Santa Maria to New York City is a kind of a benchmark lane. It's the highest paying of the three strawberry growing regions. Rates are up to 365 a mile. That's compared to 228 a mile in May last year. So loads of strawberries from uh, west to east are currently running about a buck 40 higher uh, per mile. Uh, on Ontario volumes, they were up last week also. Uh, that followed a, a 4% uh, per mile, week over week increase. Rates out of Ontario are averaging about 341. Having a look at the market condition index for flatbed, um, rates increased about 12 cents a mile in the top 10 markets last week. Uh, but as is the case that we've seen in the last year with flatbed, the average hides some wild fluctuations. Uh, for example, in Memphis, uh, volumes are down 4%, rates are up 11 cents to 355. In Houston, uh, volumes are down 12%, uh, but rates would jump by 17 cents a mile to 270. Uh, and on the short haul lane out of Montgomery uh, into Atlanta, there's a, it's a very tight capacity lane. It's right on that ELD exempt lane. It's only 161 miles, so you can get in and out within a day. Uh, but volumes are down out of Montgomery, but rates are up about 70 cents a mile. So for, for perspective, um, on the inbound from Montgomery to Atlanta lane, rates are up around 622 a mile. Uh, which is well into round trip rate territory. Even rates from Atlanta back to Montgomery are averaging 467 a mile. So some pretty good rates on the on the short haul lanes. Of course, you've got to deal with traffic, so that makes that a a more difficult lane to price. And uh, wrapping up with our year over year review of of spot rates, the dry van sector surged again last week. So we've just seen another acute capacity crunch. A uh, little bit like the polar vortex capacity crunch that we saw. Typically during road check week, we see around 5% fewer dry van posts this year, but that jumped to 12% last year. So record high spot rates no doubt gave carriers the comfort zone that they needed to take some time off and, and conduct that much needed maintenance after a pretty busy 12 months. Spot rates jumped 13 cents a mile to end the week at 242, about 65 cents a mile higher than the same week. And remember, uh, rates are now a dollar and six a mile higher than this time last year. But importantly, this was the last week was the week when rates bottomed out at about a dollar 35 a mile before they started that uh, incredible rise all the way through year end. Having a look at the refrigerated sector, spot rates increased 19 cents a mile last week. They ended at 282, excluding fuel. Reefer carriers average around 12% fewer posts during road check week. This year, that jumped to 20%. So an incredibly acute capacity crunch there in the reefer sector. Uh, rates were Last week's rates were up $1.04 higher than this time last year and about 65 cents a mile higher than 2018. And lastly, in flatbed, um, Unlike the other two equipment types where rates spiked last week, flatbed rates only increased by five cents a mile in comparison. They did end the week at 267. That's about 33 cents a mile higher than the same week last year and about 20 cents a mile higher than the same week in 2018, which was one of those landmark years for flatbed carriers. So that's it for this week's market update. Uh, if you want to find out more, uh, go to DAT forward slash market update and download our weekly report. So with that, I'll wrap up and hand over to Ned for the short term forecast. All right. We're going to be looking at the short term forecast this week. Uh, so let's get started. Um, we're going to be beginning with our van 
uh, forecast. So um, you'll see in blue the market rates observed by DAT. And then off to the right, there are our strands of spaghetti, our short-term model in red, our rate cast model in green, and our two blended forecasts in gold and silver that are mixtures of the two in different ways and in different amounts. And you can see that there's pretty broad model agreement across the suite of models that things are, are headed up into the right, at least for a little bit. Uh, heading into the middle part, the early part of June. Uh, rate cast is a little bit more, um, has a little bit less slope. The slope is a little bit less steep than the short term model, uh, but the short term and the blended forecasts and rate casts are all in agreement that uh, rates are headed up uh, in as a result of um, the kind of un unusually pronounced uh, effects of road check week this uh, year. Moving forward to reefer. Uh, once again, you can see the blue line being the market rates observed by DAT. And then off to the right, you can once again see pretty broad model agreement that things are headed up into the right. Uh, short term is in red, rate cast is in green, and the blended forecasts are in gold and silver. And um, again, everybody's in agreement that things are up into the right. Rate cast is a little bit more bullish than the uh, short term model but not by a lot. Basically, everybody is, is expecting that things are going to continue to go up at least for the near future into the beginning of uh, June. Finally, we're moving to the flatbed forecast. Uh, once more, we have blue, the market rates observed by DAT, red, the short term, green rate cast, and gold and silver, the two blended forecasts. Here we can see that rate cast is uh, on the, the upwards train. Um, but again, once more, similar to the fan forecast, it's a little bit, the slope is a little bit less steep than the short term model, but they all are in agreement that rates will be continuing upwards, uh, which is good news for carriers and it's gonna be a little rough for brokers. All right, with that, I think we are ready to move to our Ask IQ question of the week. All right, and as soon as I pull that up, I will read it. Our Ask IQ question of the week is, why did Road Check Hat Week have such a strong effect on the spot market? Um, yeah, I could maybe just kick us off there, Ned. Um, yeah. I mean, capacity was already tight. Uh, we all, we saw the impact of the polar vortex. You know, that was the first major weather event in the post-ELD era. Um, you know, it's hard to play catch up with ELDs. You're either going to run out of hours or uh, have to take a 34-hour restart in the middle of those bad weather events. Similar, that took about three or four weeks to work its way out of the market. We kind of uh, theorised last week that we'd see a much longer recovery from Road Check Week. I suspect that'll be the case. Uh, but I think capacity was already tight. And uh, But the other thing is, I, I talked to some carriers about why they took time off last week. A couple of reasons. One is that guys that own their own trucks um, you know, they generally don't like people snooping around under their truck trying to find things that are wrong. It's, you know, they, they're pretty proud of their equipment. They know what's what's right and what's not. Uh, so there's a there's sort of a pride factor. They've also been making pretty good money in the last year. So it was a bit easy decision to take time off and um, and hit the beach. A lot of them jumped on planes and went to different locations for, um, you know, short-term vacation. So I think it was just the comfort zone of having a pretty profitable year. Uh, a pretty busy year for a lot of carriers and uh, and just the overall hassle because if you've ever been through a road check, I've only been through one and I, I vowed I would never do it again, largely because it's like it was four hours. and uh, it, But it only took like half an hour for the inspection. It just takes a long time to get in there when they uh, inspect all the carriers. So that's, uh, that's sort of my theory. I think that's uh, been validated by the fact that a lot of drivers in the reefer sector who have been making pretty good money took more time off than the other two sectors this week. Um, to, I mean, partially address this and partially address a, a question that came in from Stephen um, about the, the kind of tale of this. Uh, Ratecast was expecting that road check week would be similar to other prior road check weeks, which is a little bit of a bump, but not anywhere near the level of the bump that we have. And then we've got like, we're moving into the summer and there's a lot of seasonal upward pressure on especially reefer rates. And so I, I mean, the, the continued tightness in the market and everything is going to mean that this stuff has a lot of legs, even though mm -hmm. it's again, just like a really kind of temporary blip mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yep. yep. I mean, when we talked anecdotally talking to a, a bunch of brokers last week and they were seeing anywhere from 20 to 40% increase in inbound call volumes. So, I mean, what, re what was reflected in our lack of truck posts and just the large increase in load posts, I think, was very indicative of what was happening in the broader market. 
um, with dry vans and reefers in particular. I, it doesn't seem to really impact flatbed as much, right? I mean, I think those folks are kind of just moving along, um, mm -hmm. yep. especially when a two by four is now eight something <laughs> um, a piece. Right. When I locked in lumber in February for a building project, they were six dollars a piece. So. Right. Right. Um, we're just seeing tremendous increases across the board in some of these commodity prices. And to your point, Dean, it's this struggle between wanting to haul the expense of freight, but then also not wanting to get tied up and basically blow a couple days worth of hours because it'll throw you off all week. Right. If you get hung up on a, they could blow your whole week. If you get hung up for a four hour road check on a Tuesday. Right. Well, you could, you could lose your delivery window in a, in a heartbeat. Next thing you've lost the whole, you know, 1200 bucks revenue for the week because you're now off cycle. You might not get home on the weekend. Like there's a cascading exactly. effect from just a four hour delay. Yeah, for sure. So that's, I think, an important consideration is it's not just that four hour. I mean, right. I know if I lose four hours on a Monday morning, I'm kind of right. <laughs> in trouble for the whole week. Right. And I don't, you know, I work an office job. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we'll probably know this week or next whether a lot of this is going to stick around, the impact from Road Check Week, or if things are going to mm -hmm. kind of smooth back down to where they were, right? Isn't that a pretty, like, a fair assessment of, of what you would expect, Dean? Yeah, I would. I think it'll take uh, another full week. I think we'll know by next Monday what it looks like. Uh, but I think it'll take, my, my guess is, normally you see a pretty quick recovery. You know, like things get back to normal within a week. I think it'll take us a couple of weeks to get rid of uh, the, you know, the after the hangover effect from last week. Do you think the fuel, not to kind of bogart our question, but do you think the uh, fuel pipeline disruption is going to have any impact? It, it could do. I mean, they this morning they were talking about having uh, the pipeline back um, operational by Friday this week. There's still a lot of barrels of, uh, you know, capacity already in storage. Uh, but as you mentioned at the start of the show, there's already some outages in the gasoline sector. Um, so there'll be some upward pressure on on rates for on uh, diesel prices for sure. They're already up four cents this week. Um, you know, they're up 81 cents since the low point last November. Uh, but I think for carriers that are in the spot market in particular, even contract rates, um, you know, rates, uh, diesel's up, you know, for perspective compared to this time last year, diesel's up 80 cents a gallon, um, but rates are up at buck six a, a mile, right? So so this, this time last year when carriers were at the bottom point, they were losing 19 cents a mile. Now they're making about 65 cents a mile. So spot rates are helping absorb some of the rate increases in diesel that we've been seeing in the last um few months uh, so i think that there's there will be some upward pressure um but they need to get it back online because of the amount of volume that uh, it hauls for all of the east coast um, motorists and truck carriers for sure all right we have a ton of questions coming in so you know feel free to drop any more that you have i think we're going to pivot at this point we're running a little early which is good um we'll turn it over to ned to fire off some questions but again <laughs> Questions in the chat or comment below, our marketing team will get them over to us um, to answer on the air. Ned? Robert asks, what's the best way to source repeat carriers that will provide reliable service at a cost under the spot market curve? Dean, I feel like that's right up your alley. <laughs> um, be nice to them. Uh, I mean, it goes without saying, but I would say to you, uh, you know, carriers are very loyal people. They will generally, um, they won't tolerate being messed around much, in particular when it comes to appointment times. I would, I would, my best advice would be make sure your appointment times are dead accurate and get them on and off docks really quickly. Carriers will be loyal to you if you can communicate clearly and, uh, and be completely transparent, uh, honest, upfront. Uh, there's nothing that, you know, carriers don't have a lot of wiggle room when it comes to running miles under the ELD uh, regime. So you need to be really clear with what they what they need to be uh, expecting. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty simple formula, right? If you're a broker or a shipper, it's treat them well, pay them quickly, don't waste their time, right. um, and don't send them into kind of one-way destinations too often unless you're going to be paying round trip right so that's why i even caveat to say like it's not even pay them a lot right i i don't think um most carriers especially ones that are interested in long-term relationships are rate per mile hawks um in fact i would argue that it's almost the opposite i think there's a preference for stability and getting paid for hours as opposed to getting paid for miles i think those are when you start getting into the more savvy carriers that understand their cost and their most valuable assets, their time. So anytime you know, you're, you're wasting a carrier's time, I think you're running into some um, some trouble. I also think, Ken, I, I see a lot of uh, sort of one-way, you know, 
one dimensional transaction discussions going on, like it's about moving just this load. But that's not how carriers think. Carriers think multiple loads at a time. And I think, you know, what brokers could do a lot better uh, job at is actually working with a carrier on putting the current load into context over the course of a week as it relates to their loaded miles and their revenue per truck week. So it's not just the load and the rate. There's a lot more goes into how a carrier thinks about it. And those sorts of discussions will will bring a lot more loyalty for the for the broker network. Yeah. Again, um, you should have bought flowers for your mother and your dispatcher last week. <laughs> <laughs> Right. If you're a broker and that would be your carrier sales, whatever you call them, or if you're an asset based carrier and you're an operations manager, um, flowers or tickets to a baseball game, whatever, whatever they're interested in, I would highly recommend keeping your dispatcher happy too, not just your carriers, because um, they are the, the carriers and the dispatchers are the unsung heroes keeping things moving right now. Um, and a lot of times I would sit there and, and, and do a desk side with a dispatcher. And I'm just like, how on earth did you move that ship? It's like, well, I knew that. So and so, you know, really liked going into this area, and I knew that they'd have a load coming out um, that was lighter weight, um, with a with a quick pickup and, and, a, and a good appointment. So they were willing to take it. I'm like, wow, that's that's incredible. All right, Ned? Reagan asks, how do you anticipate the pipeline hacking impacting the market? I feel like we talked about that a little bit, but um, is there any other color that we want to add to to that particular picture? Um. No insights beyond yeah. what we've already covered, Ned. All right. Uh, Mike asks, with spot rates at an all-time highs and the heaviest period for freight coming up, thoughts on spot rates moving into June? I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of upward pressures and not a lot of countervailing force, which is kind of unfortunate because mm -hmm. rates are already really high. Like maybe for some commodities, the the price of hauling things gets high enough that there's going to be some kind of, of like small pushback on rates from the supply side. But I mean, with commodity price for a lot of commodities, because commodity prices are as high as they are, I just, I don't, yeah. I don't see that there's a lot of pressure in the, the downward direction. I don't know. What do you guys think? Not in the downward direction. I, I think yeah. you're going to run in, you're running into a very, <sighs> On the upside for bands, let's just start there. I would say that there's a tremendous amount of friction upward. I think every cent that it goes upward is um, a lot more difficult ground to cover than it would be to go downward, right? Mm -hmm. um, for sure. Not to say that it can't go upward. There's no fixed ceiling. I mean, rates can be $10 a mile nationally. Um, but to get there, it's going to be ever the more difficult than it's going to be uh, for rates to, you know, the national, the natural pull right now is for rates to going to be to come down because they're just so high. Um, yeah. And the mechanisms that would do that would be con shifts to contract, um, mode shifts, things like that. Hmm. Um, on the reefer side, I think produce could still, you know, we're, we've got what, Dean, four more weeks before we peak out, five more weeks? Uh, traditionally, can in terms of the spot rate peak around for July, but, you know, produce volumes are only just starting to get um, get going. So yeah, we're going to see a lot more volume, so a lot more volatility in those regional produce markets in reefer in particular. So four to six more weeks? At least, yep. Yeah, so I think reefers have a little room to climb, especially if you're not looking at national averages. If you're looking at, like, south of the Mason-Dixon to north of the Mason-Dixon, that kind of broad, broad corridor. Yeah. Uh, flatbed, I mean, the, I don't think those frictions exist because – a lot of times the price of what's on the truck is negotiated holistically of the cost of the transportation in a B2B manner. So I think that can be more easily passed along as the, like, you know, if you're ordering three rolls of steel, I think it's a lot easier to bake that in than it is, you know, a truckload of cherry tomatoes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think flatbeds still have room to go upward for sure. Yeah. I mean, that Which I is think kind that's... of crazy if you think about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how much longer spot rates can continue up here, but there's just not, there's pressure keeping them from going higher, but there's not a lot of things that are pushing them down. Right. Kind of natural right. market forces are kind of not pushing them down. They're just kind of, again, adding friction is how I would describe yeah. it. Um, so we'll see. Uh, David, I feel like we, uh, sorry, Stephen's question we answered. Do you th really think that reefer rates will continue up? Uh, the answer is, yeah, probably. It's kind of mm -hmm. wild. Um, mm -hmm. David asks, 
follow the up to the truck week question above. Was there a difference seen between spot and contract volumes? Volumes? Uh, volumes. We're continuing to see a lot more activity on the the spot market for sure. Mm -hmm. That's not even debatable. I mean, it doesn't seem like their shippers are able to put enough juice into the contract rates to incentivize kind of the broad shift we are expecting or they're they are expecting and hoping for back to contract rates. The latest FMIC data I think showed contract rate replacement rates up eight percent year over year um, uh, over the last two weeks. The flatbed were up like fourteen percent, and that's still not enough to entice the shift back um, that we would hope to see um, to, to take some of the stress off the spot market. Um, to, to go back to something that you said earlier that I, I think might be interesting in terms of this context, um, is there still like a railroad capacity crunch so modes can't shift really into, into rail freight? Yes. Okay. Dean can expand upon it more. I mean, we're seeing chassis shortages. <laughs> They're having trouble with containers. We're starting to see some easement, right, Dean, on like the, mm -hmm. the, the, the true ocean side of it. Right. You sent out an update that said it's still crazy year over year, but it's declining sequentially. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yep. But, yeah, I mean, intermodal is still very, very tight, especially coming west to east. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you can't – if you can't move things out of the – the market and there's not a lot of contract to sop it up or in contract prices. I mean, spot prices are so much higher than contract prices. Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be a spot market yeah. summer, not to kind of coin it with a little fancy little term, but I, I don't see, I don't see mechanisms in place that are going to entice carriers in the extreme short term to, to sign up for long-term contracts right now. Some will, I mean, there's $800 million for four higher, 800 million, 800 billion to a right yeah 800 billion to a trillion dollars worth of uh, four higher freight out there if you ha lob that in half and say half of it's dedicated and not really addressable there's still 350 billion dollars worth of addressable and you know, 80 percent of that moves contract i'm just talking about that point between let's just say 15 percent of that's normally spot and right now we're seeing it up to 20 25 percent i think that 10 percent which is a lot of freight right it's 35 to 40 billion dollars is going to remain in play through the summer because those carriers don't have any real reason to lock in um, especially when you can't get i mean they're parking consumer automobiles in large motor speedways waiting for chips and resins and foams i mean classic trucks aren't going to get delivered really this year mm -hmm. we're talking about a potentially a q2 2022 delivery of some class a trucks that order today mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the the human side of it, though, my understanding, somebody did a really cool analysis on payroll numbers and look sort of showcasing the number of folks that were moving from the um, more private fleet space into the owner operator space. And the just the, the volumes are, are not really commensurate where much many more people were moving out of the for hire or sorry, not the for hire, the private fleet space than were moving into the owner operator space. And so there is maybe some idle carrier, you know, just employee that can be picked up. I don't know. Do you want to talk to that at all, Dean or Ken or? Uh, there's definitely been a shift. I mean, uh, yeah, it's just sort of anecdotally. I've got a, a lot of people that I know have taken the opportunity with high spot rates to run under their own authority. Um, it, and it's hard to say how much extra capacity we've added because we lost a lot of carriers from the industry in Q2 last year. Oh. With mm -hmm. that um, big, big, um, you know, spike in exits, so it, it remains to be seen if we added, you know, the net capacity has actually increased. It it feels like it has, but nowhere near the level of demand. So, uh, but th I th I think that normally happens. That you see a transition where the spot rates get over that two dollar a mile mark, you start to get into uh, break even territory to run your own trailer, and uh, and that's what we're seeing in the in our numbers right now. Uh, Ned, you want to hit Casey's question? I think we missed that one. Uh, we might have missed that one, and if I did, yes. Uh, how much success do you see shippers having posting and covering their own loads as opposed to using 3PLs to do it? How much possible cost savings could be accomplished by this? So that's a loaded question that we can kind of parse <laughs> out. Um, <laughs> First part of the question is we're seeing it happen a lot more recently, right? As shippers need to access the spot market more, um, 
they are naturally turning to the best way to, I mean, subjectively, I guess, the best way to access the spot market is through the DAT marketplace, right? We have over a hundred and some thousand carriers, um, the largest by far. But the best analogy I can provide is um, when you sell your house, is it for sale by owner or is it you're going through a real estate agent? And I think there's a lot of um, research and literature out there that would seem to suggest that it might be uh, it might be a little unappetizing to pay a realtor six percent off the top, right? When you split it between the two realtors, but there's a lot of research out there that suggests that on average you get that and more back in an inflated price on your home because they're marketing it for you. They're helping with all of the services, and I know that I, as a kind of busy professional with a family, don't have the time to list my house, market my house, handle all the showings and set up the inspector and stuff like that. And that analogy isn't 100% perfect with the services that a broker provides. But if you think about onboarding the carriers, making sure that their insurance is up to date, tracking the load if it goes awry. Um, and th there are a lot of very valuable services. So I think it's really dependent on your unique situation, how much cost savings you're going to have. And I would encourage you to think about it holistically. So if you're saving I don't know, I'm going to pick a number completely arbitrarily, 5%, and you're going to miss 5% more delivery appointments, which is going to cost you in chargebacks from your shipper or your, you know, the consignee, depending on your arrangement. Is it worth it? It's kind of a decision you need to make. Am I missing anything there, guys? No. I mean, the other thing, to, it's sort of linked to Ned's previous question, that is the shift towards dedicated that we typically see during this phase. So there's, um, in terms of, you know, part of the answer to the question is about shippers and having success, you know, covering their freight uh, requests is this uh, shift towards, you know, more managed transportation services to lock in some of those, um, you know, their transportation costs so they don't blow their budgets. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that you're right in the, the sense that it's not necessarily a wise move, but I could see that for a lot of shippers who are really like budget conscious because their incentives are aligned with meeting their budgets as opposed to like the overall efficacy of moving the, that freight, maybe that that starts to look more attractive. Yeah, I mean, it all comes down to your average mid-sized broker is going to have tens of thousands of carriers in their role, you know, their approved carrier list that they can tap into, their managing relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you only ship on a handful of lanes and you're really just looking to expand your carrier base for your overflow, and that's a very common technique um, to have like your core carriers that you're contracted, your kind of expanded overflow carriers that you have a contract with at general rates, but you only tender them your overflow or non-accepted freight. What we're seeing is a lot of shippers are adding a, more, a few more carriers um, kind of off paper. So they're on a, they have a carrier agreement, but they don't have paper rates in place. So that they have a little bit more flexibility before tapping into like the true spot market. Because really the spot market has levels, right? Yeah. It's not all like there's a large difference between a shipper who has a contractual relationship with a carrier that they tender that load to and signing up for DAT this morning and posting your load available and getting a random carrier to cover. Like that, it's not binary that way. Right. right. There are usually routing guides and waterfall. Like there are waterfalls of routing guides that most shippers of substance have where they go to their core, their core contract carriers, their backup contract carriers. They might go to their, um, what they would call like their spot load pinwheel. Um, however, they tender that out and say, hey, five carriers that are backups that don't have rates with me, I have the shipment. And then if that's not, they might tender it to a broker or tap directly into the spot market. So I know we make the mistake sometimes of talking about it as if it's this binary thing. It's really not. There, there's a lot of levels to it um, that they have to go through. So we have a doozy that just came in, Ned. I, we might have to table this one for next week because we're running long. Uh, the Nathan question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I think we got to table that. Uh, can uh, I'll, read, I'll read the Silent Warrior Knives comment first, and then we'll do the Nathan. We'll, we'll address the Nathan question, but we won't answer it. Uh, Silent Warrior Knives comments, uh, personally, as a truck operator, I would not have an issue taking re regular loads at just below spot as long as I was taken care of fast in and out times. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And then finally, Nathan asks, the impact of California AB5 on spot and contract, do you guys want to kind of address that issue in a very broad sense? And then I, we don't have the time to answer it because it's wild. Right. No, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't need. We'll okay. research it for next week. I know it's a big yeah. topic. Um, like everything with California, um, from ruining how I could buy a lawnmower to <laughs> um, things like that, it causes all kinds of issues. And but it also kind of sets a standard that eventually mostly permeates the rest of the country. So we'll take that back and look at it. Um, Okay, we'll hit this one real quick with Warren. As far as contract rates are concerned, what are your thoughts on length of agreement? 30 to 60 days really isn't what we would consider kind of a contract when we're talking about contract rates. That's if anything's like a project or a mini bid. Mm -hmm. It's happening a lot right now, but I would think of that if I were you as a carrier um, as really just a short-term rate lock. So think mm -hmm. of that as really spot freight locked for a short term. If you're a shipper, I would honestly kind of treat it the same way. Um, we're seeing a lot of perishable food shippers or things like that using techniques like this to ensure that they're getting the consistency they want um, while also making sure that they're paying market rates so they don't have fall offs. Right. And they can get the coverage that they need, um, if that makes sense. Anything else to add, guys, in 30 seconds? Nope. 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 All right, cool. So I'm going to wrap us up. We ran a little bit long. Thanks, everyone, for the questions. It's really the best part of the show for us um, and hopefully for you as well. So keep it coming in future episodes. If we didn't answer anything on air, ask IQ at DAT.com or hit us up on LinkedIn. Um, TIA this week, just a reminder for that. We we'll also be, will be dropping my long form conversation with Trent Broberg of Assertus, um, an auto hauler, and they do a bunch of really cool stuff. Awesome conversation. I don't know when it comes out this week, um, but it will drop this week. I'm sure we'll have it all posted out on LinkedIn and whatnot, but really recommend checking that out. Loved having that conversation. I learned a lot. Um, so again, uh, that will be dropping. You can just check out our LinkedIn or, or YouTube or Twitter for that. I'm sure it'll be posted on all platforms. But with that, we'll see you guys next Tuesday. Uh, thanks for joining us. And thanks to Ned and Dean, as always, for um, really providing the sizzle uh, for the program. <laughs> thanks, everyone. I, don't, I think that's the only time anybody's ever said I have some sizzle. <laughs>